This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fellow rushing. Uh, me and Java and Kevin were just laughing about last week when I was broadcasting from West Texas, and I was using a borrowed phone, and the lady who owned it walked in, and it, the sound cut out. I couldn't hear anything because it was, com- it was coming into her her her, her ear. What? Uh, hearing aid. Yeah, into her hearing aid. And she kept coming in. She said, they're asking about fertilizer. <laughs> Yeah, we were. I, I like. I still want to. I feel like I still should apologize for hollering in her ear because all I was saying was, "Felda, can you hear me? Can you hear me?" Yeah. Well, did you keep it clean? That's what I want to know. <laughs> anyway, we're going to be talking about garden today. It's uh, you know, it's a kind of a nice weekend. It's muggy. You know, it might rain some areas and all that, but uh, it's a good time to be doing stuff out in the yard if you feel like it. If you feel like getting out there, um, it's a good time to plant stuff. Uh, there's all sorts of things that like the cool weather head. A little bit late for planting summer stuff, you know, late late for tomatoes and peppers and, and marigolds and stuff like that. But if you can get a good deal on some flowers like marigolds or zinnias, or something, go ahead and put them out because they're probably cheap and you can get two and a half, two, two and a half, maybe three months out of them. And that ain't bad. Uh, anyway, I brought in a handful of flowers from my bouquet and back I brought my, my, my nasty coffee cup that I can't use for coffee anymore because it's got a hole in it. I don't know if I told you that, Java. Well, I was a little... Uh, uh, there it is, right there. Yeah. You, you can see it. It's right by the B in the MPB, so I can drink a half a cup of coffee at a time. Because I knew you had a new cup, and it wasn't as broken in as this one. No, no. <laughs> this is this one I, I use for my flower arrangement everywhere. I, I bring, bring in stuff from my yard. I've got... Um, some uh, African blue, blue basil. I got big old zinnias, American beauty berry, and some dusty miller. I got some some uh, garlic. What What's else? that kind of that, that kind of uh, that frosty? Uh, that's the only thing I can wait. I can this describe stuff? it. Yeah, that frosty white. Uh, that's that's called artemisia, and it's one called uh, Palace Castle. It spreads. It gets about a foot and a half tall, and it spreads out about three feet wide. It smells it smells kind of funky, but it'll keep mosquitoes away. Okay, if you rub it on you. But anyway, it's uh it's just a little. Uh, it's a ground cover type stuff. Yeah, and, I've seen it around. Yeah. Oh yeah, it'll and it'll take you know ten below zero, and uh, <laughs> and it'll go for two months with no rain and hundred degrees. So it's an ideal plant. It's sadly it's not you know a lot of people plant this other stuff, a real similar called Dusty Miller. It looks like it, but it's it's whiter, it's lighter in color, and uh, it's an annual. But anyway, I got all sorts of stuff, including some beauty berry and where else did I find? I found something in it. Oh, here we go, a seed pod. From a magnolia tree. Look at the little red berry-looking thing sticking out. Oh, yeah. We used to throw those at each other. They got a really <laughs> peculiar smell. Oh, a real peculiar smell. But anyway, I want to... It reminds me of walking around barefoot in the fall. This is a time of year to start you know, planting stuff like that. Dogwoods and uh, magnolias. You want to grow them from seed, you got to take these little red berries. And if you rub it, there's a seed inside, a little black seed there. Uh-huh. You got to get it out of the fruit because if you leave it in the the berry, it won't sprout. So you get it out. You rub the seed out. You put it in the uh, either you can plant it in a pot, leave it outside, and sprout in the spring because it needs to be exposed to cold, uh, wet, chilling type temperatures to sprout. Or you can put them in a plastic bag, throw them in the refrigerator, pull them out next spring, and plant them and come right back up. And but. you rustled those your bouquet, and I can smell it now. <clears throat> yeah. Like I can, I, it's real. It's really fragrant in here. Yeah, well, in a in a kind of a funky. Way. Oh, and this this plant here called American Beauty Berry. It's got golf ball sized clusters of, I don't know, macrail. Is is that purple? Is that mag- I don't know what color uh, that is. It's not it, magenta. It's it's a purple, but it's not a deep purple. Yeah, this is a native plant. Grows out in the woods and has uh, all of them down the stems. It's got these golf ball sized clusters of a berry. They're edible. They taste blah. It's like eating raw oatmeal. But get this, <laughs> the leaves of it. I've got a not a real pungent smell, but you can take the leaves and rub them on your arm and keep mosquitoes off. Now, I was going to ask you, because I've been seeing a lot of articles about foraging. Yeah. And is it is like, is is now the time for foraging or something? Oh, you can, you just... can, you can forage year-round. I've got, matter of fact, I've got a little uh, publication, a little, little thing I write, a little PDF I send to anybody on urban foraging. Here's the kind of plants that are commonly found in towns and gardens that you can eat, but you never think about. 
you know, yeah. weird, weird stuff. So uh, I, I, I might bring that up next week and uh, and we can talk about that. But there's all sorts of stuff out in the yard you can eat that you wouldn't think about eating because we ain't hungry enough. And because there was some, uh, we were at my parents' house and the kids were, uh, you know, in the yard and they saw some mushrooms. And the first, no, 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 first, no, 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 what, no, was, no, 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 and that was the first thing they said. Oh no, don't touch the mushrooms! Don't touch no. the mushrooms! There are some edible ones out there. There's some delightful ones out there. I don't eat them. I don't really like mushrooms. I only eat oysters. I just soon eat a spoonful of mayonnaise. But there's some delicious, delightful mushrooms out there. But for every one of those, there's two or three that'll shut down your kidney in four hours, and it's not a good way to go. And you don't want to chance it. No, no. <laughs> so anyway, we got all sorts of stuff. Uh, again, I can talk about it. I brought some garlic. I'm planting maybe not this weekend. I'm going to work up the dirt and plant some garlic this uh, up soon. And um, there's just plenty of things going on. So uh, if anybody wants to talk about things like that, give us a call. It's toll-free, one eight seven seven. MPB ring. Uh, we've got the lines wide open right now. Kevin Farrell's over there. The esteemed Kevin Farrell is doing the phone, thinking of weird words, I'm sure. But uh, anyway, if, if you got some things about lawn care, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people saying not, not, now is the time to winterize the lawn. Well, it's really not. It's past the time. But I suppose if you put some out this weekend, you can get away with it. But the problem is if you fertilize grass too late into September or October, it greens it up, makes it real tender right at the time when we start getting our freezes, and that causes problems. So we want to get plants ready for winter, not wait till winter to winterize it. It's past the recommended date for putting winterizer out, but if you want to get on it this weekend, water it in real good. I'm, I, I, you know, it's, it's your yard. It's probably not going to kill it. But um, other things, uh, I noticed that uh, I saw some, some uh, fall color on poison ivy. Poison ivy starting to fire up. Uh-oh. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's getting to be fall. I haven't seen any goldenrod around Jackson yet, but there's lots of stuff that's saying the days are getting shorter, and that tells plants. It's about uh, red wave, red, ultra red, far red, ultraviolet light. Okay. The shorter the days, plants start slowing down. They start sealing stuff off. They stop pumping stuff in the leaves. The leaves start showing colors, and uh, they're going to start falling. So the, the trees are already saying it's time for us to slow down. Yeah, because the true autumn equinox, I know a lot of people just count now as fall, but the true autumn equinox is, I believe, next week the yes. day is really going to be like, the amount of daylight and, and night is going to be split in like That's right. 12 hours, split That's right. exactly ne- in half. Yep, next week. And uh, before then, in two days from now, is the uh, International Talk Like a Pirate Day. And I, 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 I have one of your cheesy tunes little, queued up, and sweet. it's... It's it's fun. It's yeah, fun. so the 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 uh, <clears throat> car kid kidashian anyway whatever I can't remember the 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 name of the group but they sing children's songs. But uh, anyway, if you want to give us a call, toll free one eight seven seven MPB ring. Let's talk with Greg from. Is this from Batesville? You from Batesville, Greg? No, Burnsville. Oh, up Burnsville, Yuka. Okay, I got you. I got my my, yeah. my, my Fishamingo County. Yeah, way up in the ice box. So what's up? You got it. Well. I've got a couple of grafted pecan trees. At this point, they're 15 or so years old, and and, and they're beginning to produce a few pecans if I can fight the squirrels to get them. But but the important issue is this time of the year, I'll get these um, caterpillar kind of um, silky nest in there. I I just came in from outside. I mean, it's perfect timing. There was a big cluster of them at the base of a tree, and and I did spray them, and, and in the tree, I've noticed, particularly the last few years, what looks like maybe a borer that's going in, um, particularly maybe at a at a limb or leaf joint, and um, there's a seeping or weeping that's coming out of the bark. From, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing it's an insect borer. It could be. Here's the deal with pecans. First of all, those those uh, tent caterpillars. Uh, mm-hmm. which was what they're called. Some people call them web worms, but tent caterpillars is a little bit more accurate. Uh, th- each one of those was from a single moth that laid a mass of eggs. Every one of those was one moth laying a bunch of eggs, and they spin that silk to sort of protect themselves while they eat some leaves. Uh, if you can reach them with a sprayer, you know, that'd be fine. But the truth is, these these trees are starting to drop their, you know, starting to fall anyway. It looks worse to us, and it really causes major problems with the tree. Okay. And uh, a lot of people, you know, if you can reach it with a fishing pole and wrap it up and pull it down. But a lot of people say, well, you just cut it off or you burn it. Well, both of those do a lot more damage to the tree than caterpillars eating some leaves. So if you can live with it, you know, it's it's more cosmetic 
than anything. As far as the, the borers, pecans, like, like other hardwood trees, do have a lot of the type of beetles that bore into the, the, the you know, they bore into the bark, and then their larvae go around and around under the bark and, and make tunnel, which can girdle a tree. Uh, the problem is, uh, and most of the time, a healthy tree with plenty of moisture will push them back out. So a lot of times there's a hole, a little weeping. That's just a tree defending itself, uh, which is good because once they get in, there's nothing that will reach them. There is no spray. There's no treatment that you can use once a borer gets in. Most of the time, again, the trees compartmentalize it or push it out. And as long as it's weeping, I wouldn't worry about it. If you see sawdust coming out of it, that's the problem. That means they've, they've really dug in. But, uh, again, not much we can do about it. You know, I was raising a pecan grow, raising pecan grow squirrels and and stuff dripping out of trees and dragging broken limbs to the to the burn pile, just part of my childhood. Okay, okay. Well, I've had pecan trees at other times in my life, and you know, when when I planted these as little grafted trees and I nurtured them along, yeah, you, you just you, and I'm finally at the payoff stage. Right? Yeah, right, right. Here, I'll, I'll get some nuts showing up there. Um, yeah, I yeah. just don't worry and, if I can keep them another 15 years. And here, here's one other thing. You know, we had a lot of ice uh, back in, in, was it January or February? I don't remember. Whenever yeah. it was, we had a lot of ice. Well, that bends branches down, and it cracks them. It cracks the upper part of the stem. It cracks the uh, the those little crotches of the, the joints where, they, the, where they, they sprout out. And those cracks, uh, you get water and dust and stuff like that. That can lead to decay, and also insects mm-hmm. can come in there. So a lot of times we see damage from ice storms that shows up two or three years later because of just the, the cracking under the ice load. It's really hmm. weird. So, but, you know, that's part. As long as the tree overall, as long as they look okay from halfway across the yard up high, I wouldn't worry about some lower limbs. That's just sort of part of the pecan tree life is dropping older limbs. All right. Well, they do have some lichens that are showing up not on a, the, the, not a pr- the trunk. N- not a problem. Lichens grow, oh, okay. on, they grow on rocks, tombstones, and iron bridge railings. They, lichens grow on anything that's stationary. Uh, it, it, this next spring, if you'll throw some fertilizer under the outer spread of the branches, not up close to the trunk, way out there, or fertilize any grass nearby, that'll help the trees about as much as anything. Doesn't take much. Okay, good. Why? Well, I, I do fertilize. Um, it, to tell you the truth, this is a, a getaway place, um, so uh, I'm not here full time. But, man, it just gives me joy to come, and I uh, planted some apple trees. If I can keep the deer away from them, I do have them fenced in now. So are you sort uh, of – is, is it away from other folks? It, it is. It's I, away I, from other I folks. I got a, a solution that I learned from my great-grandmother that my mother used, my grandmother used, I've used against squirrels and pecan trees. It's a 410 shotgun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, right now they got those weird-looking larvae, those wolves or whatever they're in them, but, uh, so don't eat them. But anyway, I'm not saying right. be cruel to them. Enjoy them as much as you can, but it's your pecans. I know. Absolutely. I agree. Well, listen, thank you. I've, and, and you have put my mind at ease, at least. I don't feel quite as worried, but uh, no, I, I do enjoy the show. Take a walk, kick, kick around some leaves, smell the air, look for some butterflies. Will do. I can do that. Okay. Appreciate it, man. All righty. Thank you so much. You bet. Okay, we've got another caller on the line and a couple of lines open. You can give us a call. I'm Horticulture's Felder Rushing, me and Java and Kevin and the other folks here at MPB. We're glad to be here, glad to yak with you about stuff. There's some events coming up um, If you've got the, that I'd like to mention. One is going to be the Fall Garden Day that they usually have down at Crystal, at Crystal Springs at the Experiment Station. It's actually during the week. I think it's Monday through Friday, the first week in October. Not going to have vendors, but they've got a lot of cool stuff out there. Give you some ideas about what you could be having in your garden this time next year. If you know of some garden events I can help promote, give us a call. Toll free, one eight seven seven mpb ring Meanwhile, if you get a chance to get out to a garden center, if they got garlic, you grab it. Because a lot of people are planting stuff right now, and the supplies ran out last year. So we'll take a real quick break and come back to more of this stock gardener here on MPB right after this. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. The original Southern Remedy is available as a podcast. Subscribe using your favorite podcasting app. You can email a question to remedy at mpbonline.org. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy.
Okay, folks. No, we're not celebrating pirates because they're mean and horrible people. But international talk like a pirate are. By the way, and this is an old joke. You know what the pirate's favorite letter of the alphabet is? <laughs> the C. It'd be the C. That's <laughs> right. It'd be the C. <laughs> I had to pull that one out. I had to pull that one out. Hey, I want to give a real quick shout out to a guy named Jared. He's uh, he works at uh, Enterprise Car Rental and is a about your age, okay, and he listens to the Gestalt Gardener. Oh, well, wow. you know, big old guy said, "I love your program." Thinking you need to get a life, man. You know, <laughs> but, I told you this 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 show alone gets you know gets me more recognition, <laughs> you know, than anything across all sections, across all sections, demographics, everything. There you go. And before we go, to this next call, let me mention that in two weeks, October the second. I mean, excuse me, October the first. We're going to be broadcasting live from the Max in Meridian. We did it uh, last spring. It was real popular. And we're going to be doing it again, uh, uh, that and a plant swap. So if, you, uh, if you're if you interested in that, I'm also giving a program on that Saturday. So October 1st and 2nd at the Max in Meridian. That'll be a whole lot of fun. Now, Gary has been hanging on from Oxford for a long time. Good morning, Gary. Thank you, sir. How are you doing this morning? Fine. What's going on? Good. I've got some questions about uh, bearded irises. Mm-hmm. I've, I've had uh, had them for a number of years, and I've had a whole bunch of them start withering, and uh, the the rhizome gets real soft, and just uh, they're basically dying out. Yeah. And I thought it was from all that rain that we got, but then I've got some that are dying that are doing the same thing that are yeah. you know clearly not in a drainy area. Yeah, well there there are a couple of fungal diseases that that get on the the rhizomes of of bearded irises and um uh, and I f- I forget the names of them like I think the one's called soft rot or whatever. And what the it two two things first of all you the best control is prevented the best you can. I, bearded irises are one of the only plants that I know of that everybody who knows recommends planting it on top of the ground without any mulch at all. That rhizome, the top of that ropey root needs to be baking in the sun. That, that They're from a Mediterranean-type climate. That's what they grow best. And if they get covered up with mulch, with leaves, or if they stay wet, they simply rot. So, you know, right off the bat, uh, every time I see irises being planted in a botanic garden, you know, they cut the leaves in a fan, they stick it on top of the ground, they step on it, mash it halfway in the ground, and they walk on. So right off the bat, that's going to be important. There's not any fungicides that will control those rot diseases. What they recommend is is uh, dig up the ones that are affected, cut away all the rotten stuff, you know, just down to the firm stuff, and let it dry a little bit before you replant. You know, that's the official recommendation is dig them up, cut them off, let them dry a few days, and then replant on top of the ground. You know, no, no fungicide sprays. And, uh, you know, just make sure that with all this rain especially, if they're not, they don't want to be mulched because that causes rot. Okay, and so there's nothing to do with the with the dirt itself after taking them out or anything. No, it's just like cold germs. You know, we have cold germs. We don't always have colds. The same thing with with these uh, these natural fungi. You know, they're 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 opportunistic, and uh, they're really not going to cause a problem to plants that are that are growing like they want to grow. So the the number one, you know, the, and there's no way to control them anyway. There's no fungicides that kill fungi. They're more or less prevention to keep stuff from spreading. So a lot of times, you know, if you go online to the like the Iris Society website or something like that, they may suggest when you dig it up to dust the the, uh, the rhizomes of some kind of fungicide before you replant. That's mostly a temporary thing. In the long run, you know, full sun, baking it, you know, the top of it showing and uh, hope we don't get too much rain, at least on that part of your yard. And that's pretty much it. Well, I sure appreciate it. Okay. And by the way, when you're cutting away, you might might find a caterpillar, you know, a little worm or something in there. But there again, they're secondary. They come in after the damage has already started. I got you. All right. Well, I sure appreciate it. Good luck on it. All right. Thanks. You know, Java, we were talking earlier about this uh, this artemisia, this great, looks like Dusty Miller. A lot of people know what Dusty Miller is. This is a really hardy perennial that spreads. This is a good plant to plant around other stuff, too, because it likes to be Utterly, miserably, no rainfall type of 10 inches a year dry. And so it's a plant that I see uh, people planting around iris and other things that don't need a lot of water because it covers it up without covering it up. That makes sense. And like you say, always kind of filling the space yeah. with different 
different things. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do with the, all these things I brought in. I got my coffee cup, and I'm going to make me a little arrangement because some big stuff in there, some Philly stuff, some spiky stuff in there. By the way, uh, Jason Klein, our boss, brought me a new cup just then. It's glass. It's not ceramic. My so ceramic I, cup got all, you know. It's not going to get as um, funky. Decorated. Well, decorated, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we'll see if this, if this, uh, if glass can get nasty, too. We'll see. Anyway, let's go up to uh, David in Grenada. Hello, David. How are you? Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. What's up? Well, uh, you may find this interesting. Uh, um I was doing some work in the pasture, well, right on beside the pasture where the pasture and the woods uh, at a fence line. Uh, I was working there, and I was pulling up trees and making room for stuff. And uh, and uh, one of the little trees was uh, was interesting. So uh, so I gathered up the uh, seeds and uh, you know leaves and stuff. I was going to Mississippi State anyway for another reason. So I took it over there and had it identified because I had no idea what it was, and they. I was standing there talking in the hallway, and uh, this professor walked up, and he knew exactly what it was, so I was excited there. Uh, but uh, when I got home, I uh, I looked. I've got two uh, book on trees. One uh, from long; they're all from a long time ago. But yeah, uh, one was a Southern Guide to Trees or something like that. Another one was uh, Audubon Society's Guide to Trees or whatever. Right. Anyway, it was not listed in either one of them. Well, what is it? It's a strawberry bush. Strawberry bush. Well, it wouldn't be in a. It wouldn't be in a tree bush. It would would not be in a tree book because it's a shrub. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Well, yeah. that explains it. But yeah, it's, what, it's uh, a cool thing. You know, and here's what country folks call it. They call it hearts a bustin. Because you know when the seed pies open up, the little red uh, th- uh, when the the husk pop open, those little uh, red seed look things pop out. It looks like hearts breaking open. Uh, yeah, yeah. See, that's what got my attention because that was about a week ago, and uh, so uh, I got a I got a uh, strawberry bush or whatever you called it. And, uh, strawberry uh, bush, were and uh, it's it's actually a native euonymus. You know, you, we we plant euonymus as a landscape shrub, and, and it's and it's nice because even the twigs on it are green. Well, it is now. So I don't. Does it stay green all winter? No, no. The tw- the twigs do. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. It's a funny shade of green, yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's very attractive. So, uh, it's a I cool plant. Red, I read seeds off of it, and I thought I'd see if I could germinate them. Yeah, no. I've never seen, I have never seen one. I have never seen one in... Uh, well, sometimes you got to get off... Sometimes you got to get off your backhoe and look at stuff up close, man. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. But Listen, uh, can you suggest uh, how I could germinate the seeds? Is there any something special I need to okay. do to do that? I'm gonna to have to look it up, and uh, and and I might be able to do it do it dur- do it during the break. But most native plants that have fleshy berries like that, whether it's euonymus yeah. or or magnolias or dogwoods, most of the time they're designed to be eaten by birds and possums and other stuff, digested, the seed cleaned and dropped on the ground, and then lay out over the winter time, exposed to chilling and you know chill moist chilling condi- winter time conditions before they'll sprout. So, uh, and I'm not sure about the euonymus on that, but that's that. I would give that a try. What you do is you get those red berries, you rub the the seed out of it, clean them under some running water real good, and either put them in pots and stick them outdoors, or put them in a, a plastic bag with a barely damp piece of paper towel. We're, we're trying to create humidity and put it in the refrigerator, not the freezer. And the refrigerator and the dampness will make it think it's laying out all winter on the ground. Then next spring, put them out, and they should sprout again. You know, that's, do, that, do, that, this, do this next spring. Don't do it right now. Oh, no, no, no. You know, you want to plant, you know, no, they, they need to be, clean, the seed need to be cleaned out of the, the little berry and exposed to chilling and cool temperature. So you do that in, in the fall. Uh, you know, that's that's what happens in nature. So uh, go ahead and try, you know, again, rub the seed out of the, the little red berry, clean them good, plastic bag with a barely damp piece of paper towel in the refrigerator. That makes it think it's been eaten, digested, cleaned, Dropped on the ground oh, and exposed okay. to wintertime for little sprout so and spring. I don't have to eat them and uh, <laughs> well, dig you, it out of the, the waste there, do I? Do, do some of these. Let us know how it works. 
<laughs> no, I wouldn't tell anybody that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You bet. Hey, g- great. I-, I love it. You know, we're talking about a-, a real guy out there. I'm just pulling some trees up to, you know, plant some other stuff, and I found this cool little plant out in the woods. And well, I took I it in. Well, I've got a big, it's a big wash. I'm, okay. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, it's a big belly now. You can, you once you see what it looks like, you get your eyes focused on it. You'll see some other scattered. You can cut some off down to a old foot, foot and a half, or two tall, and move them out to your yard. But keep in mind, they like to be in the shade. Oh, that was going to be my next question. So they they won't grow out in wide open. Like, they will, but they they they'd rather be. You, you, you never see them along fence rows. You always see them in the woods. There's a there's a reason for that. Well, I ain't never seen one at all. But anyway, all righty, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye. Now, how country do you have to be to know that it's called hearts of busting? <laughs> I was raised by I was raised by country folks. My great grandmother was a horticulturist, and she knew all the Latin names and all about the garden club. She said, "That's not a strawberry bush. That's hearts of busting." You know that kind of thing. <laughs> but anyway, I love it. This guy's got a backhoe out there pulling trees out so he can plant some other stuff. And then I like I love how it wouldn't be in the tree book because it's a it's a bush. Yeah, it's a shrub. Yeah. But luckily for me, I knew the plant because it's a cool plant. So hard, hard to find commercially. Uh, let's go up to Hernando. Is it Shay? Hey. Hey. Oh, is it Shay or Hey? It's Shay. Oh, hey Shay. Hey, how are you? <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> oh, not much. Yeah, um, I got a uh, question for you regarding uh, pollarding or coppicing, and uh, I, I've, you know, I just live in the, you know, a neighborhood, a backyard. You know, I'm looking at a space under an acre, so I'm trying to maximize the amount of space I have. Yeah, and I was interested in one of those practices for a red mulberry as well as a black willow. Well, do, do, first of all, they're, they're two different things. Uh, coppicing is when you cut it down almost to the ground and you let them sprout out these long sprouts and leave them there for three or four years so they make real straight uh, uh, fence posts. So coppicing is cutting it to the ground every three or four years to grow posts. Pollarding is when you cut something back to that little ball like they do crepe myrtles, and it sends out these long, skinny branches that you can, and this way mulberries are grown a lot of times. They're, 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 they're treated that way. So um, if you coppice, if you cut it to the ground, they'll sprout back out, but they won't have any fruit. So what you want to do is leave some, you know, cu- you know cut them back to it like a ball, like you see people doing crepe myrtles, and then that new growth that comes out will have the mulberries, then you cut that back, uh, you know, the next year. Okay, and... Both uh, both trees are probably in their second year of growth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mulberry is already uh, taller than I am. Uh, so when would be a good time to make that first cut? You know, I don't I don't remember if mulberries produce. I think that they produce on new growth uh, in the in the spring and early summer. So that tells me I, I'm, I'm making an educated guess here because I'm I'm a real fan of of of, of pollarding. Um, usually that would be done in the winter time. It may need to be done right after you get through harvesting every year, so the new growth comes out. And then, in, in, in other words, I don't know if it's done in, on mulberries in the winter time or immediately after harvest in the summer. I, I just don't know. I, okay. I, I'd have to look that one up. But that would be an easy one. You know, just Google uh, uh, pollarding mulberries. Now they got real soft wood, so that tells me that it might be better to right after you get through picking in the summertime to cut them back then. Okay. Now, that, that, that's just an educated, I'm just thinking through this type of guess. Right. It, it's a young tree. It hasn't produced any fruit yet. Yeah. In fact, there's no branches on it whatsoever right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, wherever you make your cut, that's where the new growth is going to come out next year. So decide where you want that fist, that, 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 that ball, okay. wherever you want it. You know, cut it back to there, and then next year when it all sprouts out, cut those back. And then, you know, leaving a few stubs and eventually make that little ball there. Okay. And and the black willow, uh, I'm mainly just trying to turn it into a into a bush for a caterpillar habitat. Yeah. Well, you know, you could coppice that one. Uh, and I see this a lot in, in uh, botanic gardens in England. Royal Horticulture Society always has areas where they're, they have coppiced and pollarded plants. And things like the, the willows and uh, the red twig dogwoods and stuff, they cut them back every year. Uh, in the spring, and they send out these long willowy stems, and they're so pretty in the winter time when when they, they drop their leaves. So uh, I would imagine the willows probably be, be best to cut it down closer to the ground. Okay. 
All right, that's that's it. Thank you. Cool, cool constant. By the way, um, when we when I say pollarding, other people they don't hear it, but if they see what I'm talking about, they say crate murder. <laughs> You know, okay. you you see how people do that, and it really drives people around the twist when you do that. But it's been done for centuries in Japan, China, and England. That's where they get the little weaving stuff. They make their little woven wattle fences. This, uh, it doesn't hurt the plant at all. People don't like the way it looks. I'm saying, you know, you put your toilet paper the way you want. Let me put my toilet paper the way I want. <laughs> all right. Good luck. Sorry about the rant. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. All right, I appreciate it. Okay, appreciate it. All right. See you, Shay. I got on a rant there, didn't I, Java? Well, when you come up with the uh with the crate murder subject, you can always expect a little, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's there's people who want me to cut my long hair, but the guy on a hundred dollar bill, Ben Franklin, he's got bifocals and long hair too, so I'm thinking you do you. There you go. We got time to do a little cheesy tune thing? I think we do, man. Okay, this is a a, a tune that's about uh, a fella who used to, to peddle fruits and vegetables from the back of his truck in New Orleans called Mr. Okra. I'm a horticulturist, Felder Rushing, Java Chapman, Kevin Farrell, all the other folks here at MPB. We're just sitting around having a good time, and if you can join us, that'd be great. If we can help you something, that'd be mo' better. We're going to take a real quick break. We've got the lines wide open. You want to give us a call? Kevin's sitting there. He's leaning back. He's got his feet up on the desk. Put him back to work. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more of the Gestalt Gardener right after a little bit about Mr. Okra from New Orleans. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fellow rushing. I ran out of time. I was trying to see whether the euonymus uh, uh, americanus, the strawberry bush, or hearts are busting where they need to, to treat those seeds. But my guess is if it's got a fleshy fruit, it's designed to be eaten by wildlife. That means the seed needs to drop on the ground clean and go over the wintertime nice and chill and moist. There are some plants that come up right away. If you know somebody's got a red buckeye, it grows out in the woods. It's a, a native woodland plant. Red buckeyes have got these big, half the size of a golf ball size, big brown seeds. You can plant those in pots right now. As soon as you get them, as soon as that leathery uh, husk opens up and it's got one or two or sometimes three seeds in there, you put them in a pot an inch or two deep, and before fall, before winter, they'll be six or eight inches tall. They come up right away. If you store them, they dry and they don't do so well. But anyway, a little, little weird stuff about propagating plants. Now let's go to... Uh oh, that's Bill, but I can't see because of my Bible. Is it Williamsburg? Yes. Oh, where's Williamsburg? Uh, it's between Collins and Prentice. Okay, way out there is what we say. All right. <laughs> Where are you from, man? I mean, you know, I'm from a little town in the Delta. I got no room to talk about people being from out there. Sure. <laughs> What's up, man? Right. Uh, I've got 50 year old. Hello? Yeah. Yes. I've got 50-year-old, 50-foot-tall uh, uh, Stuart pecan trees that have phylloxera. Oh, boy. Or phylloxera yep. or whatever. Ph- phylloxera, uh, The yeah. last two years, yeah, the last two years the leaves have been curling and dying with blisters. Um, when I read about it, it said the recommended spraying. But how do you spray 50- and 60-foot-tall trees? Can't. I go about doing that. Can't. Or I've even considered pruning them. Well, the pr- pruning does as is, is much damage as the phylloxera does. Uh, here, here's the deal. You know, the, the insects, they overwinter as eggs under little bark scales, and they hatch out just as the trees begin to first bud out in April. You know, when the first little bit of green growth, an uh, inch, inch too long, inch or two of new growth, that's when they hatch out. And they crawl onto the new twigs, the new leaves, and then they make that hollow gall around their, their, lar- their eggs and larvae. The only way to control that is to spray the trees while they're exposed. And it only takes one or two sprays, 
you know, in, in April, because that's when the young ones are, are out there before they do the damage. The, but the problem is you can't hit the top of the tree. I was raised in Pecan Grove, and uh, I live in a neighborhood that was planted with pecan trees, and it was developed back in the 1940s, and they are just a horrible mess because nobody can spray them. And uh, yeah. there there are some, you, you may have, if you go online, you may read about some systemic insecticides that are put in the soil. Uh, that works mm-hmm. later on, on mites and aphids and stuff, but it doesn't really affect the phylloxera that much. It may c- kill a few of them, but they still make those knots and galls. So unfortunately, some trees like Stewart and Desirable, those what we call paper shells, they're highly susceptible to phylloxera. And without sprays, there's really not much you can do. I'm real familiar with it. We're, I was raised with it. Yeah. Do you have a recommendation of how to spray it? No. It's a, it's okay. a, it's, you know, you get, you got to have a, one of those sprayers that, you know, that puts it way on up there. And unfortunately, and, and it doesn't take a really powerful insecticide to kill them. They're like little aphids. They're, they're easy to control. You just have to get good coverage and timing is real important. Or sometime around the first week or so in April, if you'll, if you'll pull a limb down, you'll see that the new growth gets, oh, a half inch, inch, maybe a little bit longer of green before the first leaves sprout out. That's when you put your first spray out, and then another one you know, a few days later and maybe a third one later. You know, But the first couple of three weeks is when you can get your phylloxera control for the whole year, and it's, it's tough. Will, will this kill the tree? No, no, it won't. Matter of fact, all it does is it just it knocks some twigs off and knocks a lot of leaves off, and it ruins a lot of the fruit because you know, they, they hit that new growth that, is, that has the, the, the male and the female flowers on it. So mostly it just ruins the crop. Okay, but the trees won't die because of this. No, no, not at all. Okay. I've been thinking about replacing them, so good. Well, you know, uh, the, the other thing, and, and again, I was raised, I love pecans. Pecans, they're, what, 3,500 calories, you know, they're, they're incredible uh, uh, native fruits, but, native nuts. But the problem is they're also weak-wooded, they're brittle, and you know how they're always dripping sap all the time? Yes. That ain't sap dripping out. That's insect excrement. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look up with your mouth open. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a little drippy stuff. That's the best bug excrement. They call it honeydew. Okay. <laughs> Not making this up. Anyway, they're, 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 they're great plants when they do well. When they're not, they're just, eh, they're just okay. Well, well we have some much older, um, just seedling pecans, much bigger trees, and yeah. they have no sign of this at all. Yeah, yeah. There are some pecans that are resistant to it, and uh, I don't know whether it's because they, they leaf out later. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, most of the little seedlings, they're hard to crack, but they're really, really good. They're, they're really oily little meats in there, but they're oh. just, you know, the big paper shells are the worst. Yeah. Sorry. All right. You've been very helpful. Okay, and I Thank wasn't you insulting though. you about being from a little town. I'm from a little town, too, so I apologize. Good I don't care about that. Okay, see you, man. I'm proud of it. <laughs> there you right, go. Thank you. Yeah, so you know, I need to watch my mouth sometimes. Okay, let's 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 go to McCall and talk to Carl. Hey, Carl, how you doing, man? Down in South Mississippi. Oh, I'm doing very well, Felder. How are you? So far, so good. I've been stepping on on my tongue all morning, but what's up? Well, I recently bought six catalpa trees. In half gallon pots, they're six to eight inches tall. Uh-huh. And I was wondering when do I plant them? How large do I make the holes? And of course, I'm interested in those caterpillars that we call catalpa worms. Yeah. And I wonder if there's anything in particular I need to do to encourage them. Yeah, a, a couple of things. First of all, they're really tough plants. They don't like wet areas, so make sure where your plant doesn't have standing water. And other than that, about all you need to do is dig a pretty wide hole, you know, two, three feet across. You don't have to add anything to the dirt, but at least two, maybe three feet wide. And then loosen up the potting soil and the roots when you plant it. Don't just pull out the pot and stick it in the ground like a plug. So, you know, be sure to loosen it. And that's about and stir that into your dirt, and that's all it takes to get them started. Um, I would either keep it nice and clean around it or use some mulch and a ring, you know, not a not a fire ant mound or a volcano, but a ring around it, you know, to keep the ground, you know, less weed and keep the lawnmower off of them. But other than that, sunshine and, you know, good well-drained soil, and, you know, they get pretty big, but commercial catalpa worm growers – prune theirs back every year so they have lots and lots of new growth with you know for more worms and it's easier to reach the worms 
Okay. So, you know, you can prune it like a great big bush. You know, like some people do fig trees. You know, they cut them back every year just a little bit. So they're, you know, they're, they're good size. They're huge shrubs or, or small prune trees. Now, right. as, as far as getting the worms, you catalpa worms come from catalpa eggs laid by catalpa moths on catalpa trees. And you've got to have the okay. catalpa moths before that will happen. So if you're just putting a catalpa or two out there for the first time, may not the moths may not know about it yet. So you might next year want to find somebody who's selling some catalpa worms and get some live ones and then put them on your trees and then let them sort of lay their eggs and do the pupa thing in the ground and all that. In other words, you might need to, to, to salt it, so to speak, with some worms. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to know. More than you want to know. By the way, they have some burgundy foliage catalpa trees, so you can have them that are, that are, that are pretty to look at, and then the worms have something to eat, too. I'm okay. just I'm just saying. Hey, I'm not against pretty. <laughs> all right. I'll take that. Good luck on it, man. Oh, oh, and right. you, you can do this anytime. You know, it's late enough in the summer where you can get around. You, you know, if you can wait another month till sting, things start dropping their leaves, it'd be easier on the tree to wait another month or so. Okay, I'll do that. That doesn't mean you can't. You don't wait to dig the hole. I'm not letting you off the hook this weekend. Yeah, well, this weekend is too wet to dig a hole anyway. <laughs> there you go. Well, good luck on it, man. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. You bet. Goodbye. All right, we've got the lines open. we got time to know the call or two if you want to give us a call, talk about gardening. I've got all sorts of stuff about about uh, about Euonymus Americana, the strawberry bush, but I can't find how you plant the seeds. It just says they reseed easily. Here we go, foliage twigs eaten by deer, seeds eaten by songbird. i got a feeling you need to get these seeds and rub the, 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 the berries and rub the seed out and put them in a plastic bag over the winter time or just put them in a pot leave them outside and forget about them the seeds will think just just think they're laying out in the woods you know come up next spring anyway horticulture's fell to rushing me and java i've got a whole bunch of uh garlic i'm gonna start planting this weekend and um got some cabbage plants some collard plants some kale plants so i'm gonna set out some seeds and some things it's gonna be a garden weekend for me and the dirt is just right too we'll be right back after this All righty, I was showing my ignorance about Williamsburg. As apparently, uh, Java found out it was a county seat of Covington County back in the 1800s. Yeah, from 1829 to 1906. All righty, so Williamsburg uh, got a lot going on there. Let's go up to Kosciuszko now and talk to TJ. Hey, TJ, how, how long you been from Kosciuszko? Hey, Feller, how you doing? I'm fine. How long you lived in town? I'm a Delta transplant. Okay. I've been here about 25 years. Well, then you know Mickey Grove. He 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 moved from Indianola. He was the band director in Indianola, became the band director of Kosciuszko High School. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My son marched for him. Yeah, me too. Well, what's going on, man? Yeah, yeah. I'm from, I was originally from Winterville, Mississippi. <laughs> That's a, that ain't you a town. That, that ain't a town. What can I help you yeah. with? <laughs> ah. I'm planning on doing a metal lawn like you d- describe. Yep. When do I need to plant my white clover? Now? Yeah, and that's a good time. You know, a lot of people wait till October, but late, late September. If you put it out, the problem, if you wait, you know, it's not going to sprout till it gets some rain. And if we don't get rain till till November, it's going to be too tender to take that first freeze. So, the, you know, if you go ahead and put it out, you know, the sooner the better and let it get rained on a time or two, it'll get a head start before winter. Gotcha. That's kind of what I was thinking. All righty, man. It's got to have some water. Hey, my sister says hello. Uh, well, tell her I said hey. Yeah, Sandra Johnson. You went to I, Mohead. Yeah, with I sure her. did. Sure did. We're talking about 40 years ago, my friend. Yeah. I'll <laughs> oh, tell her I talked to you. Okay, man. See ya. Thank, thank you, brother. Oh, I knew something. Actually, I've known some stuff today. I usually get stumped real bad. You know that, Java. Yeah, that, yeah. Nobody has hit you with the plant question that you didn't know, but uh, it didn't mean you know as Williamsburg you know, threw you threw you for a little loop. Though. It did, you know, but you know at the same time it's a you know we're we're full of small communities. Matter of fact, I live in Jackson. I live in a neighborhood called Fondren. It used to be a little town outside of Jackson, and uh, and it, we still consider it a little town. So you know, I consider myself living in a little village, 
people ask me where I live. I say, I live off a of gravel road in Fondren, Mississippi. And they say, well, that's nice. To the fact I'm talking about a Jackson neighborhood and the gravel road is State Street. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the city. <laughs> but, you know, we got our, you know, we got our bank. We've got our, our, our restaurants. We've got our little hardware store. We've got the coffee shop, the super. Got everything that I need within a 10-minute walk. Yeah, Fondren is its own, its own neat uh, little area, like yeah. you say, right here in the city. Yeah, and yep. you know, and to me, that's it's just like gardening. You know, people try to garden as if they they live in England or Japan or someplace. We got some cool stuff that does well right here. Native plants, uh, adapted import plants. You can have a cool little little garden wherever you live that that looks like where you live. That has a sense of place using plants that are that are tough enough to grow in a cemetery. You know, without a whole bunch of care, you don't have to have a lot of horticultural skills to have a nice-looking yard and garden. You do have to have an attitude, though, that some stuff ain't gonna it ain't gonna work. That's the what. That's <laughs> like I tell people all the time when I speak about you. I speak about you often, Felder. Uh, <laughs> but you need to get a life, Java. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I tell him. I say, you know, he is a big, uh, you know. Uh, pusher of native plants to Mississippi doesn't try to get you on things that won't do well they might look pretty for a while but they won't do well here in Mississippi a yeah. lot of native things can be just as beautiful or quote unquote exotic you yeah. know um, just native to Mississippi uh, speaking of which I do a little bragging here uh, and before I mention it let me mention one more time on October the 1st, we're going to be broadcasting live from the Max in Meridian, Friday, October 1st. And I want everybody to come out because this will just be a lot of fun. But I got interviewed by somebody from the Washington Post yesterday. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, you sent them to me. Uh-huh. And, uh, and they want to know about using native plants in the garden. And I sent them a picture of, of a garden that is 100% native flowers, native to Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, 100% native. And the picture was taken of the Royal Horticulture Society Garden, but Hort- Botanic Garden in, uh, in Manchester, England. They got a better looking garden than I do, and it's all natives. Wow. And I grow stuff from England and Japan and stuff like that. <laughs> Talk about cross cultural. Yeah, that's right. It's all good. It's all good. It's a great weekend to get out and plant some stuff. It's a good weekend to think about uh, cleaning the yard up. It's not quite as hot, still kind of humid. Some vines to pull, some weeds to do, some mulch to put out. But uh, it's also a good time just to walk around and look at the pre-fall. Look how the trees are starting to look a little faded. They're starting to shut down. The leaves are, are, are being cut off. And as that it cuts off the green stuff phase and it release it it, it it shows all those wonderful colors that are underneath that are being masked by the green chlorophyll so we're at the cusp of it and uh, next week is going to be the first official day of fall two days from now is talk like a pirate day or that's right don't be like a pirate but talk like one Anyway, I'm Horticulture's Phil Rushing, Java Chapman, and Kevin Farrell, and all the other folks here in uh, 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 Jason Klein, who brought me my fancy new coffee cup. We're going to see if it gets nasty or not. It's okay. If you get a chance to take a kid to a farmer's market or go to a farmer's market yourself. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a farmer's market in Jackson and met a young, I, I wish I'd gotten her name, a young uh, young woman, she's like 13 or 14 years old. She says she listens to my program, and I ran, ran into her at a farm. Farmer's Market It's where people learn how to grow stuff from people who grow stuff. If you can't grow it, you can get it from stuff who grew it locally. Anyway, if you get a chance, take a kid to a farmer's market or a garden center, get them a bag of, of a bulbs or 